Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this new episode of the Big Real Emerging Law Voices series. It's the first episode of the new year of 2024, and because of the festive season, we thought of differentiating a bit this time and hosting a singer together with us and not a law person. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the honor and the pleasure to host here on the Big Real campus the singer and vocal coach Kelly Ayres. Kelly, welcome here. It's a pleasure to have you here because you have two attributes. You are also a singer, as I said, and also a vocal and life coach. So first of all, do you want to tell us a bit how you do? Sure, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be on this series. Um, I am a vocal coach and a singer, as you say, and a, a life coach. Um, and I just love connecting with people. Um, I've always sung since I was little, since probably before I could talk. And music is just really powerful and it can just really make a lot of change and move people. Um, and I got in, people kept asking me to teach them to sing. And I just really enjoyed it and I wanted to combine it with life coaching, so to do with well-being and helping people express themselves. Kelly, you mentioned yeah. something very important that I want to touch upon. You said that music has the power to change people's life. And law, presumably, also has the same target, to try to make a difference, a change. But when it comes to well-being, the last few years we have seen the UK government also putting forth legislation in order to address the well-being of employees in different organisations. But do you think that addressing the traumas of people, how much music can play a role in addressing the traumas of the people? Music is so powerful. It just has its own language um, and... As you say, a lot of laws have come into place and mental health is really important now. The government are recognising it. It's um, international, like I think lots of countries, lots of people are really focusing on mental health as well as physical health. And music, I just think, has its own language, as I said, and just a way to people to connect, to feel things. You feel things through the lyrics, what the song's about. Um, even songs in different languages that you don't really, even if you don't know what it's about, it can just move you, like the instruments, the way it evolves, it can make you feel, and um, yeah. Tell really you now, you bring to my mind the famous uh, song uh, of uh, John Lennon, Imagine, Imagine of the People, that creates also utopia, a pacifist world, an aspiration towards peace. The question is, when you're teaching uh, your songs uh, to the people, to your students, uh, do you teach uh, also just the lyrics or also the general background? And if not, whether you think you should teach that a vocal or teacher, a vocal coach should teach also the general background of a song? So I think it's really important to do both. So in our sessions, we have te the technical aspects where we, um, you know, people learn, the students learn how to sing and how to deliver. Um, vocal exercises and things that also I like to do I don't know I guess it's called like lyric therapy like where we really analyze the lyrics and it gets people to sing it with more emotion so sometimes like I'll get the lyrics up and we'll go through it and it helps people connect to the emotion of the song the message and they might have like an interest in that whether it's like you say imagine for for example something worldwide something global or something closer to home like whether it's like a heartbreak or a death or a celebration um, and so I like to do these sessions and see people as a whole um, kind of a holistic approach and I'm also a trained life coach as you mentioned and I've sort of developed this way of delivering vocal coaching mixed with life coaching so some of our sessions are just singing some of it we talk as well, so we talk Which about what's going it's on. It's very important also for us, meaning lawyers and the legal academics, on how we must interpret also legal text, meaning with imagination, with behind the lines, not in a very dry and legalistic uh, way. So that's also a lesson that uh, we, as lawyers, can also take uh, with us. And Kelly, of course, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, the song of yours that I like the most is Money, Money. <laughs> I don't know if you also like it the same, uh, because you have a variety of songs, of course. Uh, but uh, regarding, first of all, you want to tell us a bit about the history behind Money, Money. And uh, the question is, because also in the legal profession, everything is about the pursuit of money. How much do you think is the same also with music? And uh, if yes, if it should be the same, meaning if we should look only at the money aspect in law or in music, or we should look also behind the lines in ideas, in romance, in imagination, and in creating stories for people. 
Sure. So Money Money was like a fun remix project that I did um, with my sister, Natalie Erez and Ian Carter. Um, and it got to number 11 in the Urban Club charts. Um, and it was just like a fun song about money and, and how actually it was about a relationship and how money isn't everything. That's the irony of the song. But it just seemed to take off a little bit. Um, money is important in music like it is in law because you need it to fund things. You need it to fund you know, life and the associated cost with it. Um, but it's not just about that. Music is one of those things, I think, where a lot of musicians do it for the love of it and the connection um, to the subjects, connecting to other human beings. Um, but it's called the music industry, so hopefully there's a bit of a balance to supplement or you know, make it a, a living too. And tell you now, your focus is in R&B, which is a genre of the style <coughs> that actually characterizes uh, the people of the Caribbean. At least it came historically from there. Uh, and uh, my question is, when you are singing an R&B song, when you go to the high notes, because every note has a significance also in the song, so it expresses a pain. Do you feel this pain, and how much do you think that this pain is personal pain or more collective pain? of the plight, of the suffering of all the people, because we have also, as we know, and our viewers also know, the issue of slavery there, and uh, also the UK ties with slavery. And uh, we have Barbados, for example, some years ago, taking away the Queen as head of state, and mm -hmm. Jamaica also pleading uh, against uh, the slavery uh, that uh, took place there. So the question is, how much do you think that R&B expresses, at least in your experience, when you sing, uh, this pain. Yeah, sure. So, black music, like R and B music, soul music, really does come from the soul, as you say, and it does, you know, derives from the pain that people experience. Um, and for myself, when I sing, I sort yes, of yes. like I just express myself. I I just love it. It's such like an expression, and sometimes it's easier to sing than talk. Um, although I'm quite a talker, so I can, do, I can do both. But I like to give a space for people to be able to express themselves. And I just find it, it's more, it's very passionate with soul music and R&B. And um, it definitely comes from the history that you're describing. If I can ask you now a musical question, what's mm. the difference between R&B and soul? They're quite related. So um, R&B, rhythm and blues, soul, sometimes... They're quite, they're quite related. I think it's sometimes the instrumentation and the, the vibe of it. Um, but they're quite similar. Can I love as both. As you may know, and also our viewers may know, I come from international law background. So I'm in favour also of globalising things. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is it also about music, meaning how much music can be global? And if it's the case here, because we speak about the Western world and also the Western music, pop, rock, we don't hear so much about African music, so much about Chinese opera, for example. If we go to Covent Garden, we see only Western opera uh, being played. So how much do you think that music is amenable, is friendly to this opening, to the global scene, or to the so-called global south, which comprises Asia, Africa, South America? I think you can have different, like, different genres, as you say, and the more... Um sort of like the R&B and soul, so the things that I really love to do, sometimes that might not be so mainstream, so it might not be as popular in some countries. Um, and then some things that are more commercial, like um, I did a song years ago that I then heard um, like in different countries, and it was like a dancey song, and it was, a, it was just something fun, but it was more commercial, like upbeat, beat, you know, and people in different countries were messaging me and saying oh, they've heard it, or like friends who were on holiday, and it was just quite interesting. So that kind of went more mainstream, more global. Do you think also the language plays a role? Um, sometimes, but I think English is like, it's like international, isn't it? So like, even some, some, when some songs, like I've done, I've been on J-pop, uh, like Japanese pop and K-pop um, songwriting camps, I songwrite as well. And um, so even then, so we'll, we'll write, we'll work together in a team, we'll write different songs. And then some of it gets translated um, by a translator, but they might leave um, a few English bits, especially for the hook. So then that bit can become a bit more commercial. So even in England, it might take off a bit um, and then people catch on to the English bit, like baby, baby or something like that. 
and tell you also music is something intangible. We can't actually view music, although maybe it would be very nice if we could see also the melodies and the notes. How much compared to other forms of art, meaning painting, sculpture, how much do you think that music can actually affect the people's feelings and instigate a social change or a global change? Meaning if I want to change the world, should I paint something or should I write a musical piece? No, I think there's a place, of course, for every type of art and different people respond to different things differently. But with music, for me and a lot of other people, it's just really powerful. Like, I know I'm being repetitive, but it just, I really believe in it. Like, do you ever think back, like when you hear a song, um, it reminds you, it can transport you back to a time in your life when you were experiencing something, a time when you were away or a time when you were going through a trauma or... Um, a happy time and sometimes like you can just sit with someone and not say anything and there could be a song playing it could be really romantic or it can be really like meaningful sorry there's a song that I've written called shine which is all about um, letting go of your tears and being allowed to cry and really feel your emotions and sometimes and it's about being there for a friend and saying you know you can talk and let your feelings out and I'm not going to rush you and I'm here to listen and sometimes like the music and the lyrics just help you express how you feel without even having to say anything and so I do think that while all st there's a place for it all art I think music is just like I don't know maybe I don't know what I should say a bit extra because I'm probably a bit biased but I've had experience of it really t making a difference making Kelly, an you impact. also have a university education we have to say you have yes. a degree in marketing so you have passed from the class of the university classes and we're here in Be Well, a university institution. Of course, I am also a university professor. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, to which extent do you think that university professors, maybe, in their teaching, do they take a dry approach? And how much do you think? Because now you're trying to teach music to people, mm -hmm. and you come from a different background. So do you think that we, meaning uh, law people, law instructors, uh, can take some uh, lessons uh, from you as uh, music <laughs> instructors. Yeah, why not? Everybody's welcome. I think um, I studied me. I studied marketing and advertising at um, London College of Communications. It was London College of Printing back then, um, and I did that because I didn't want to just focus on music. I wanted something. I don't, don't want to say a fallback plan, but something that I could relate to my music. So I'd have to market myself, and marketing's everywhere. Um, and I just remember when I was studying that I loved. I loved uni, I love studying, um, but there are different ways of learning. Like, you know, people have different learning styles. So people have, sometimes they might be auditory, they might be kinesthetic, where they are being walked through something and that's how they learn. They might be visual. Um, and I think that is one of those things that can be adapted. Um, and why not have a bit of support for like the lecturers who are like very you know they've got a lot of things to do they've got a curriculum to adhere to and teach and it's nice to just let off some steam and express yourself through music and it's i get loads of people coming to me like from different backgrounds some of them are professional singers um some of them just literally want to sing as an outlet and they just want a place to come and just to sing and let go. And as you say maybe now that the music, teaching music is more informal up to a sense, yeah. and maybe also university teaching also has this adaptation to these informal learning modes like peer learning and also uh, the use of social media, the use of uh, technological advances. So we can combine many styles and many modes of learning and this is important uh, lesson we can all take. And uh, Kelly, as uh, you said, in essence, uh, you deal with all kinds of people from different backgrounds. And this is also something similar to law education. Mm -hmm. How much do you think now that when you teach music, this gives you a more global perception about the world? Meaning the fact that you may have a student from different backgrounds, how much does it make you aware of the plights, of the suffering, of the problems of another people? Because in law, this is the beauty of law. For example, when somebody studies, especially international law or transnational law, we understand also how other cultures behave. So does teaching music or even singing, learning a song, give you the same idea, the same exposure to other cultures and other ideas? I think what I love about what I do is the connecting with people. And as you say, there are different types of people that come some of them come face to face, some of them are online. So I have people in different countries that come and we do them on Zoom. And um, and I like 
getting to know the person. So they often tell me about what they're going through and they might talk about what's going on in their country or what they're having to experience. Um, and again, singing is just something for them that they can use to express themselves and kind of get away for a moment, like get away into their own world and create their own environment, their own kind of sanctuary where they just express themselves and can forget about the troubles. Um, so yeah, like I just, it is... And I think also what's important, in the similarity between music and law is a diversity that characterizes both fields, many musical genres and also in law you have many musical, many legal fields. Mm -hmm. So law can be kind of, uh, kind of music. Uh, Different in, genres, yeah. Exactly, yes. You have criminal law, family law, uh, international law, like we mentioned before. Uh, now, Kelly, uh, coming a bit more to your personal plans, uh, I know you're preparing a CD, uh, if I'm not wrong. You can tell us a bit about uh, your personal law plans. Sure, so I'm working on new music at the moment. Um, I'm always writing and um, I'm, I've got a few projects on the go, but one of them is going to involve like really nice live instruments and make it a bit orchestral. Can I ask you something <laughs> about this? Because also, indeed, you write lots of songs. Sure. When we write a legal article, we do a bit of a research. When you write a song, do you do a similar research or it's an impulsive procedure that comes out of your heart and you put it in paper? So it's a real mixture. So I sort of describe my songs as diary entries to melodies. So I'll walk around with my dictaphone or my, you know, now with my phone, but um, sometimes pen and paper, and I'll just write out what I feel and I'll have the melody probably at the same time. But then I'll do research either before or after in terms of like the musical style. So if I'm working with a producer, like they'll want reference tracks. So I might say, I want, I'm hearing it like this, like a bit jazz based or neo soul, or I actually want to do a dance song and then I'll get them references and not for the style of music, but also the vocal effects, like the type of reverb, um, the type of like dynamics in the song. And I kind of get a playlist together. So there is like a research component to it. Um, sometimes if I'm just by myself at the piano or the keyboard, like I'll just kind of play, I'll try to play as best as I can and then I'll give it to someone like my sister or another producer and I'll say, can you play what I was trying to play but make it better? Um, so I have, yeah, my references in my mind, like, and I think I want to be that, that style, I want to do that. Um, yeah. And before you were telling us that you were preparing indeed some songs. Yeah. So you want to tell us a bit about your next musical plans? Yeah, so I'm just, um, I'm constantly writing and I'm kind of, I'm, get, I'm preparing like a theme of what I want the next project to be. So I've got different ideas, but I'm thinking it's going to be something about something like journey through the last decade. So a few different experiences that I've had over the last 10 years or more. And um, just the different journeys that I've been on, the different, I've had a bit of personal thing that was going to come out in the, uh, <laughs> it's going to come and out in the news now, Jake, it's going to come out have, in my song. And also you have the side, you have a personal side that somebody see, can yeah. also advise with and see the latest developments. Kelly, the last question refers to the comparison between global law and music. We spoke about international law and music. I want you to actually limit this question out to the European continent, mentioning Eurovision, the Eurovision Song Contest. So if I can ask you, because we speak about European law as the endeavor, as the effort of all the European countries to unite, and in the musical scene, we have the Eurovision Song Contest mm -hmm. uh, that actually is uh, for decades here. So uh, if you want to tell us whether, because we know that the last few years also Australia will enter the competition, uh, if you think that the Eurovision Song Contest is uh, an interesting project when it comes to the unification maybe uh, of the music traditions of Europe. Well, I think the Eurovision Song Contest is good at getting people together because you're exposed to different styles from different countries and it's just a nice time for people to get together so we often like a few friends of us get together and we watch it and we have you know drinks nibbles whatever and we we get a bit exposed to different cultures and then what happens is that then we might if we like a song we might research that have it on spotify or youtube and then there come suggested songs then we might and also can't, spotify, we, might we have to say also that this series is spotify yeah. so spotify can also <laughs> have a, plug, yeah. a very dual importance but then it comes up with like similar artists, so then you can get more exposed to different artists in that culture, in that in that country. So it's quite interesting. Um, 
I have noticed that a lot of songs, like a lot of country, seem to be a bit more commercial now. So a lot of them, even though they've got elements of their own country and their own cultures, there's kind of like a, a commercial and also theme that happens. And also of all the premises in the sense that sometimes we see countries voting for each other when mm. they're more amicable and the opposite, when they're in enmity, they may not necessarily associate with each other. So also law, unfortunately, maybe has a role even in a musical contest. Ladies and gentlemen, with this, we culminate this interview. We thank you very much, Kelly, for being here with us. Thank you very and, much. And uh, indeed, it was a very nice conversation on the junction between law and music. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we renew our rendezvous, our meeting for the next episode of the series, and we bid you farewell. Thank you very much.